One of our watchers said something very interesting concerning the Quiet Place monsters in one of our last videos covering the entities. It was in response to whether or not these monsters actually ate or why they didn't eat what they killed on Earth. Even the director asked that question, or rather his character asked that question as to why they don't eat what they kill. In other monster movies, if a monster kills something, we see it shoving pieces of the thing's flesh down its throat shortly after. But in this movie, they don't. For those of you who are new to the party, the Quiet Place monsters, otherwise known as the listeners or death angels, I actually like to call them the silencers because that actually makes more sense since they don't just sit down and listen. They actually silence what they don't like to hear, freaking censorship monsters, or the antagonistic alien creatures from the movie A Quiet Place. If you haven't watched it, you should totally watch that movie. Trust me, it is worth it. And please don't watch it with people who are eating chips. It's one of those experiences you actually have to be quiet to enjoy the movie. But there's still so much we don't know about these monsters. For example, what exactly did they eat since we didn't see them actually devour anything in the movie? And that's what we're going to be getting into in this video. So why is it that they did not eat what they killed? Well, we have an entire video covering that but in this video, we're going to theorize what they did eat. They came from a completely different world, many light years away, and judging from the differences in their biological features, you can expect that the creatures they also hunted on their home world, and that possibly hunted them, look vastly different than anything we have on Earth today. One of our watchers actually left a comment, as I said earlier on, theorizing why the Quiet Place monsters look the way they do. I'm sorry to the watcher, I couldn't find your comment again, but I still didn't want to feature you because you made me question as well and I love it when you guys do that. So the watcher mentioned that he thought the Quiet Place monsters probably ate something that was buoyant or something that floated. Since they have the ability for echolocation and have fish-like teeth, as the watcher mentioned, it makes sense for them to hunt something in the water. I know you guys hate when I do that. That's why I do it. I love doing it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I totally agree with what the watcher said, but I also think there's even more to it than that. I think the Quiet Place monsters are opportunistic organisms, but they also have a primary environment in which they live. If we take a look at the body plan of the Quiet Place monster, or let's just call them the silencers as I coined them. You'll notice that they have four legs, or essentially what would be legs. I think that the four legs are actually more so arms or modified arms, but they walk on all fours, so they're quadrupedal. This means that they are mostly land bound. Because of all their sharp teeth, they don't have any crushing molars at the back of their mouths. It means that the way they eat includes ripping and tearing and swallowing. That means they don't chew. I want to chew! Every carnivorous creature we know of that only has sharp teeth such as many theropod dinosaurs and deep sea fish, their only purpose for having a mouth like that is to either catch something and hold on to it and to swallow it whole or hang on to something very large that is moving a lot and tear chunks out of it and swallow those chunks whole. Creatures like us or like dogs have either flat molars or sharp teeth at the back that are very short and broad for crushing bone or eating other food sources such as fruit. It's clear that the silencers are 100% carnivorous as they have no other types of teeth than those sharp needle-like teeth we see in their mouths. So we know that their mouth is designed to catch things, hold on to them, and tear flesh and swallow. Now here's where things get more interesting. Not just their body, but take a look at how they move. In the movie A Quiet Place, there are several times when the silencers will climb with amazing expertise to the top of a very high place and stealthily wait until it ambushes its prey beneath. Not only can these guys book it and cover a lot of ground, but they can also climb very silently up and down smooth surfaces. It's crazy how silent they are. In a part of the trailer from the second movie, you can also see evidence of this in the way this creature is climbing headfirst down a wall very stealthily as it searches for its prey. Kind of funny as hell though if it slipped and fell and busted its ass. <laughs> so this is what I gather from not only their body plan but the way they move. They have the ability to run very far and very fast across vast distances. This means in whatever environment in which they lived on their homeworld, there were vast open lands in which they lived. Maybe their outer shell camouflaged with rocks or other materials around them and them having the ability to climb up walls like geckos means that on the edge of those open lands there were probably areas where they would have to climb vertically down to get to their prey. For example, on cliff faces, just imagine a very rocky open area and you're running and you're running and you're running and then suddenly from all the way left and all the way right, all you can see is just a drop. And maybe there's another cliff ahead of you several miles ahead or several feet ahead where if you jumped with enough speed or glided, you could reach the other side of that cliff and then climb up to get to the rest of that open area. Yeah, I could see a rock terrain filled with jagged cliffs on the side similar to that of mountain goat territory. Silent 
bouncers also have the ability to leap from astounding heights and not get hurt. After all, they did crash land on Earth from a freaking meteor and act like they just fell an inch. That means with their ability to climb quickly and silently and leap from heights without injury, that their prey most likely were flying or floating organisms. The prey the silencers would have to stealthily pursue would probably be floating through the chasms between the cliffs and the quiet place monsters would utilize echolocation to locate the creatures. The silencers have superb hearing, which means their prey would also need to be quiet, like crazy silent. So I think honestly that that would rule out flapping. We do have creatures on Earth that fly very silently like owls, but to have the ultimate adaptation against superb listeners like the predators in a quiet place, the prey would need to be even more quiet. They would need to be airborne and silently so. So this is what I think the setup for their world would be. Now this is just one theory I'm going to present. There's going to be one after this, so stay tuned to the end to hear that theory because I love that one and you guys can make a compare and comparison as to which one you think is better or more plausible. All right, so let's set up the world. Oh, by the way, just to let you guys know, we have a POV on this channel about the life of a quiet place monster or a silencer from their point of view. It was really interesting to do that story. So if you guys are interested in hearing what the creature might have been thinking, if it were to be translated into our language, you can check it out as well as our other POV stories. Okay, here goes you guys. And I'm gonna do it with my little documentary accent. The skies are filled with hostility and fire. And yet the hot air is filled with moisture. The group goes out today eager for the hunt. Unfortunately, today is one of those days where they will have to avoid being hunted themselves. Surprisingly enough, these creatures are not the apex predators of this world. We call them the Silencers, but they are otherwise known as Death Angels, Listeners, or Dark Angels. Our Latin name for them is Dentibus Silentium, which means silence with teeth. These creatures are blind, and as a matter of fact, most of the creatures in this environment, especially on this side of their planet, lack the ability to see. Most of the heat that is provided on this planet comes from volcanic pockets, but light and vision is something that is totally alien to these creatures. In these last apocalyptic days of their planet, these creatures do what they've always done. Try to survive. The silencers are actually very social and hierarchy based. A matriarch or elderly female issues a clicking noise that gives the others instructions to follow and to tell them what their plan is to be. Some of the younger, more nimble males head out first to distract the larger predators with many legs to give the rest of the pack a chance to embark on their hunting party. Whether the young males make it or not will determine their future in the pack. The silencers must move quickly. These large creatures, who weigh well over 2,000 pounds, need to be able to run across the vast distances very quickly and quietly. This is not just so they can stealthily approach their prey, but so they can too avoid the bigger predators that hunt them. There are no trees here in their land, and the only thing that they can best use to paint a picture of their surroundings is sound. Unlike us, the silencers can pick up many frequencies that even some of the best hearers on our planet can't detect. On their planet, the moisture in the air is not caused by trees. As a matter of fact, this planet is void of trees altogether. The heat provided by the volcanic pocket is maintained and sustained in the air by a very vital resident of this environment. It is a creature as large as a whale and has the ability to defy the harsh gravity of the planet. These massive creatures that could easily be mistaken for blimps on our world are called volets, from the Latin name volatare, which means floating. These organisms hang around the sides of cliffs or near the edges of rock faces. In their normal form, they look like serpentine mammalian creatures crossed with something reptilian. Imagine a leathery otter with a long body and four pairs of very tiny legs. The creatures don't move that well on land. They can slink in and out of the rocks and climb vertically up and down the rock face, utilizing the grooves and their sharp little claws to hook into the material. Their claws can hook into almost any material, rough or smooth, and these creatures have the ability to grow up to 50 feet long. They also have their own social hierarchy. But within this dog-eat-dog -dog world, they operate with the notion that it is everyone for himself, and only the fittest survive. Those who don't react quickly enough to the call will become a sacrifice for the rest. These creatures also have the inability to see, 
but they have an impressive sense of smell, and their little claws that they constantly have hooked into whatever surface they're attached to, constantly pick up vibrations in the surrounding area. In their world, the oldest are by far the most skillful when it comes to how well they can smell and feel. These creatures do have decent hearing, but because of their adaptation, hearing is not their strong suit, at least when compared to the creatures who predate them. Less than a mile away, the group of silencers stealthily approach. The lead female clicks, indicating that the pack is to slow down, since their prey is close by. The silencers don't have a lot of time when it comes to hunting their prey. They must act quickly and work well together when the time comes to take down their prey. The older volets on watch duty, or smell duty, pick up something in the air. These creatures produce a lot of moisture and are very much responsible for why their environment is the way it is. Why the temperature is slightly higher anywhere they go. Keeping the air moist also gives them the ability to better tell where the smell is coming from. Keeping the inside of their noses wet and primed keeps them in tip-top shape when it comes to detecting any naysayers to their survival in the area. The silencers close in. The matriarch splits off from the pack in the direction where she wants the pack to chase the prey. Chances are, they will not be able to catch the volnets in time before these creatures throw their slender bodies off the cliffs they're perched on. The matriarch and her pack have done this time and time again. The old volets emit a shriek so loud it momentarily scrambles the detection of any one individual. The hot vapour they create around them also shrouds them in a way. It allows the air to carry in a way they favour. You see, the speed of sound is affected by temperature and humidity. Because it is less dense, sound passes through hot air much faster than it does cold air. So even though the volets are spread out evenly, the warning cry spreads very quickly through the blanket of humidity they've created. The tension and anxiety causes the inside of their bodies to become hot. Gases are produced at a faster rate in excess. When you breathe normally, a healthy balance between breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide occurs. Whether the cause being because you are nervous, upset, or fearful, you upset this balance when you hyperventilate by exhaling more than you inhale. Low carbon dioxide levels lead to narrowing of the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain. This reduction in blood supply to the brain leads to symptoms like lightheadedness and tingling in your fingers. Severe hyperventilation can even cause you to lose consciousness. In the case of the volets, this process works in their favour. With anxiety and in the presence of a threat, the volets in essence do something similar. Their systems go into overdrive in lieu of a threat and they produce an excess of gases which become trapped in pockets within their tissue. This excess gas is hydrogen. Once the volets throw themselves off the cliff, the very high gravity quickly goes into action, bringing the ground up to meet them very quickly. These cliffs, off which the volets live, are very high despite the gravity, but their saving grace is the almost instantaneous emission of this gas that causes the volets to swell to four times their size. They quickly float away to safety, but all is not well. They're not out of the woods yet. The silencers have done their part in getting the herd to run and to take flight. The thing is, once the volets are landbound, they are much harder to take down than when they are airborne. They are much bigger than the silencers, and although they do not like confrontation and try to avoid it at all costs, if they are caught before they take off, the fight that they tend to put up is not worth it. It actually works in the silencers' favour to have these creatures become the blimps that they now are. The creatures float away like large flesh-filled balloons, all their bones filled with air pockets in between the joints. The matriarch silencer is already at her post, knowing that the prey would be heading in this direction. The reason is because there is a very small current of air shifting through this chasm valley, and the slightest push is all that is needed for the volets to shift that way. As the pack of silencers catch up to the matriarch, moving a lot faster than the floating herd below them, they wait and they listen to triangulate the position of the herd. The volets pull their next card. The volets are still mass-producing gas, and doing that creates a hissing sound that makes them blind audibly. They have to depend on smell, but it's not as dependable when they're moving. 
They also do not wish to ascend too high, so they release some of their gas and refill their pockets to keep them below the level of the predators on the surface. The membrane surrounding their tissue protects the volets from the ignition their flammable gas creates, and this is what they use for propulsion from silencers as they take the leap from the surface to bring a volet down. Now, with a silencer latched onto its back, the volet produces more gas in a panic as pieces of its flesh are torn asunder by the unforgiving teeth of the silencer. The silencers will work together to select a victim, usually the weakest, less experienced volet, who uses too much gas or panics, makes more noise, and is targeted. It was the matriarch silencer who had instructed one of her younger members to take the leap, being lighter in weight, and as soon as the young silencer latched on to the poor volet, well, things were immediately bleak for it. The volet who was now quite loudly panicking. The silencer also emits a short cry to signal to the rest of his pack members where he is. The other pack members leap in that direction, some of them missing and falling into the depths below, where they will have a long journey back up. The silencers waste no time thereafter, tearing the creature to shreds as it tries desperately to keep itself afloat in the hopes it can get away. The silencers must eat quickly, because as the volets die while inflating, they explode. The silencers don't necessarily get hurt by this, but it destroys the entirety of the flesh of the animal. After a long day of hunting, the silencers all cry out to let each other know where they are until they find each other as a group once more to get back to their home. All right, so that's what I put together so far for that story. And I know the accent was cringe. I just did it because it was my story thing and I enjoyed it. And it's also to let you guys know which part is a story format and which part is not. But there's something to consider with this theory. It doesn't seem at all very efficient for a creature like the volet to evolve to fill itself with air just so it can jump off a cliff to avoid some predator. I mean, while that is plausible, I don't think that's the way it would work considering what kind of environment silencers live in. I was talking this over with my partner and he actually has a better theory in my opinion. Ugh, this is so exciting. Okay, hold on. He supposed that the quiet place monsters can came from a place similar to that of Venus or Jupiter. If you guys have watched Cosmos, hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson, you'd have seen an episode about creatures as they would exist on Jupiter in the second season Cosmos Possible Worlds. Consider the body plan of the Quiet Place monsters. They are amazingly heavy, and their armor is very impenetrable, and they can survive very high temperatures and very high extreme pressures. Their body would be suitable for living at the bottom of the ocean, or living out in outer space, or living on a planet like Venus with ridiculous atmospheric pressure. To give you something to compare to, the atmosphere of the planet in our very own solar system, Venus, consists of the layers of gases surrounding it. It is composed primarily of carbon dioxide and is much denser and hotter than that of Earth. The temperature at the surface of Venus is 467 degrees Celsius or 872 degrees Fahrenheit and the pressure is 93 bar, roughly the pressure found 900 meters or 3,000 feet underwater on Earth. For some perspective of how much pressure that is, if you're at the bottom of the ocean, your body would be crushed and tissues would be torn under the extreme pressure, which equates to thousands of pounds of pressure per square inch. Your eardrums would rupture and your lungs would fill with blood and then collapse. No matter how good you are at holding your breath, you would instantly suffocate. Oh, my torso's hurting. Oh, hold on. I'm feeling it. You feel me? Not to mention, you wouldn't even be able to dive deeper than 130 feet because nitrogen gas would be forced into dissolving into your tissues and then turning back into destructive and painful bubbles if you were ever to resurface. Something like that would happen on Venus. Venus's atmosphere is about 100 times thicker than Earth. It is so thick that when the Soviet Union sent its spacecrafts there, although many of them succeeded in touching the surface, after 20 to 120 minutes, they were crushed, not to mention the impressive heat that we're talking about here with devices, much less flesh. What if the silencers come from some place, some planet similar to that, a planet like Venus? It would explain why their body armor is the way it is. Sure, there would be many creatures that would evolve to float on the atmosphere, but there would be those like the silencers who would dominate the bottom. If Earth is any indication, creatures will fill every nook and cranny and niche of a planet or moon that they can. So the same would be possible for wherever it is the silencers came from. My theory would still be very plausible in that these creatures, not being able to fly or float would find some way to hunt those creatures in the air that can. They would need the ability to climb
climb off cliff faces, mobilize vertically up and down, possess the ability to leap very far, and to hang on and pierce whatever it is they catch in the air. They would also have to eat the creature by tearing off bits of its flesh and eat very fast. That's considering it's a very big creature. Let's suppose the thick atmosphere is very hot, which usually is the case because atmospheres like this trap heat. Sound would travel very well in the high humidity or in the very moist air. That means the silencers would be able to effectively still use their echolocation to detect these large gas balloon creatures that they could hunt and bring down to the ground. Falling to the ground wouldn't hurt the silencers because, you know, we've seen that in the Quiet Place movie that they can basically crash land on Earth and fall from great heights and it doesn't bother them. Now, we explained that, but we still have to explain, in my partner's theory, why they don't have eyes. Well, he said it best. With an atmosphere that thick on their planet, similar to that of Venus or Jupiter, whether it's tidally locked with a star or not, the Quiet Place monsters would always be under some cover of darkness to the point where it honestly really wouldn't be necessary for them to have eyes. Again, let's use Venus as an example. Venus has a thick atmosphere and ergo, it has clouds. These clouds, which are made up of sulfur dioxide and drops of sulfuric acid, reflect about 75% of the sunlight that falls on them and are completely opaque. These clouds are the reasons we can't see the surface of Venus and beneath these clouds only a fraction of sunlight reaches the surface of the planet. Standing on the surface of Venus, everything would look very dimly lit with maximum visibility of about 3 kilometers or about 2 miles. Suppose on the planet the silencers came from, the clouds would be so thick and the pressure so high that either Either no sunlight would reach the surface or only a fraction of sunlight would reach the surface. This would explain why the creatures would depend mostly on hearing. The theory that I used prior in the beginning for the story was partially based on a pseudo documentary about dragons and how the dragons were able to take flight to evade predators or other predatory members of their species. Taking flight was aided by them having gas glands or such so they could like, basically float. They're not really floating, they can fly, but it assists in lifting them off. So I then applied that to the volets. But honestly and scientifically, I I think that my partner's theory makes way more sense in terms of biology for the creatures from The Quiet Place. One last thing before ending this video. You're probably wondering why The Quiet Place monsters would even need to open up their head like the freaking Demogorgon. The silencers already have great hearing, but imagine them climbing up a cliff face to find out where these gigantic gas creatures are that they're hunting. I imagine the only indication that the silencers would have of the gas creatures location would be the slight hissing sound they probably would make as they're ascending, or maybe the sounds that they make so they can echolocate to tell where they are or where other members of their species are. When the Quiet Place monster opens up its head like this, it acts as sort of like a satellite to triangulate where the sound is coming from. This is to aid in them echolocating to get a map of their surroundings based on where all the members of the species are. I believe also that the Quiet Place monsters lived in social hierarchy where they worked together. And I imagine, just like I said in the short story, that the leader would be somewhere on the side of a cliff looking in response to prey it just located. In that message, probably telling its pack members the altitude and distance of the prey. Then there would be a second monster doing the same and confirming and then a third with all three of them effectively triangulating the signal of where the prey is coming from and how far they will need to jump to get it. Being on a cliff they would have to find the closest one or effectively climb up higher to stealthily jump from a distance to catch it. Maybe two would stay at a lower level to tell the other silencer who's climbing higher up how much farther he or she would need to climb so that when they jump they could be the most successful. It's kind of ironic that in the first Quiet Place movie there were three monsters in that region you know you may be wondering then why didn't all three of them hunt the humans together? Well, based on what the director said, these creatures purposely wanted to take over Earth. Of all the fun theories that we always glean from the Quiet Place monsters, John Krasinski intended for the creatures to be intelligent enough to consciously and purposefully act on eradicating all humans. Effectively, to do this, they wouldn't just be hunting or taking down one large prey, it would be genocide and termination of many small prey that's easy to kill. Since these creatures are effectively very squishy, us humans, which the Quiet Place monsters would have found out early on, they would need to all be together. Maybe their regular hunting party would take over one region and then they would stretch out to find surviving humans or other creatures that make noise or that they deem as a threat. For all we know in the beginning of the movie, the Quiet Place monsters or silencers were all hunting alongside each other and spread out when the mass of humans were eradicated. And if they know or guess that there are some other surviving humans still out there, there's no reason for 
for them to all be together in the same place. In this case, it would be more efficient to split up. Anyways, that was very fun. I really enjoyed doing this video. It took a very long time. Look, I even wrote a script partially for the video, just like someone suggested on Patreon. This video would have taken a shorter time, which is why I usually try to do it off the cuff or just like I'm having a conversation with you guys. I understand I mess up sometimes. I apologize for that, but I try to get videos out fast as possible and writing scripts is not really conducive to that. Anyway, what do you guys think about the story? What do you think about this theory? Let us know in the comments and thanks so much for watching. This has been Altiori. You ask, we answer. <laughs>